Albert Pike is one of the most amazing men who has ever lived. During his long life he was a teacher, an explorer of the western frontier, a newspaper editor, a poet, a short story writer, a linguist, a lawyer, in fact he's still regarded as one of the outstanding lawyers of the 1800s, an advocate for the rights of women and for the rights of Native Americans, a worker for reform in the criminal justice and educational systems, an orator whose work is still reprinted in collections of Southern literature, a general in the Civil War, and a philosopher. He built the largest house in Little Rock, Arkansas. He made and gave away fortunes. When, in the last years of his life, he moved into apartments in the House of the Temple, his personal library contained more than 8,000 books. He was a profound student of philosophy and religion. He was that, and he was the man who more than anyone else gave the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry its present form. He was Sovereign Grand Commander of the Southern Jurisdiction of the Rite from 1859 until 1891, and he has left us a powerful legacy. But, after all, he lived and wrote in the mid and late 1800s. Can what he created, what he had to say, have any meaning for us now? A Mason was wondering that just the other night. John, my father, was a Mason 30 years before he joined the Rite. He often told me that one of his deepest regrets was that he didn't join the Scottish Rite much earlier. It just expands your knowledge about Masonry. No, no, they're called reunions. That's when we get together and bring men in to the Scottish Rite. Oh, it's a great learning experience. It's all about ethical thinking and self-development, and you meet men from all over there. It's really a great time. Oh, you've heard of Albert Pike. I tell you, I am so fascinated and curious about that man. He wrote so much about the Scottish Rite, and of course he revised the rituals that we use in our degrees. John, one of the things I appreciate most about Pike was a book that he wrote, which were actually the lectures to the degrees of the right, and it was called Morals and Dogma. I know a lot of men think it's a really difficult read, but I can tell you it is a university course in, in Masonic philosophy. I just, I'd give anything in the world to actually be able to meet this man face to face. Oh, I know, he's been gone since 1891, but I can dream, can I? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's getting late. I think I'm going to read a little bit and then turn in. And, John, you really ought to think about uh, joining the Scottish Rite at our next reunion. Tell you what, I'll bring a petition by uh, the next time I see you. Okay. Well, you have a good night. Bye-bye. The teachings of these readings are not sacramental, so far as they go beyond the realm of morality and to those of other... God commands us to love one another, to love our neighbor as ourself, and we dispute and wrangle and hate and slay each other slay because we another. cannot be of one opinion. Because we cannot agree whether this doctrine or that one be truth or heresy.
Kom ind. Kom, kom ind. Well, come in, sir. My daughter Lillian had retired for the evening, and I'm afraid I was drowsing by the fire and did not hear you. Gra Grand Commander Pike? Your servant, sir. Uh, have I the honor of your acquaintance, sir? No, no. My name is Robert Davis. You don't know me. I'm from your future. The future, sir? Yes, Grand Commander. But I suppose you can't believe that. <laughs> Sir, two years ago, I made my railway carriage, eating excellent food, riding in safety and comfort with, with a uh, privy not at all far away, the same trip from Independence, Missouri to Taos, New Mexico that I had made in uh, 1831. That first trip I made on foot and horseback, it took 75 days. We were beset by wolves and blizzards and bandits and nearly died of hunger and thirst. The second trip took four days and I rode in ease and comfort. <laughs> I can believe virtually anything. No, sir, it seems to me that there are three possible explanations. Either you are here, or I am dreaming this, and I do not think I could dream the cut and style of the habiliments you wear, <laughs> or you are dreaming. Whichever it may be, you are welcome, sir. Well, thank you. How may I be of service, sir? Well, I've been an active Scottish Rite Mason for a while. Excellent. I greet you as a brother. Well, thank you. And it's, it's beautiful work, and, and it's exciting and all that, but there's just some things that I don't understand. Well, for instance, things that you have written in this book. <laughs> I am hardly astonished, sir. For a number of reasons, the book had to be written very, very hurriedly, and I never did have a chance to go back and edit it properly. Perhaps one of these days, I... Ah. No, I see from your face that will not happen. No, no, don't misunderstand me. It's beautiful, some of the most beautiful words I've ever read. But it's more than a hundred years old. I live in the 21st century. Do you think that it can still be relevant for the men of my time? Do you still have poverty? Oh yes, we still have poverty. Hmm. Is every boy and girl educated to their full potential? No, I'm afraid not. We have fallen behind, far behind, the academic standards that you enjoyed in your time. Oh, you sadden me, sir. An ignorant population is a despotism waiting to happen. Uh, have women been allowed to reach their full potential? Well, we've got a lot closer with that, although we pretend that there are no differences between men and women. That is shocking, sir. In my time, when gifted and talented women are taking their place beside men as, as business women, as teachers, as scientists, as doctors, it would never occur to them that they were anything but women and are, I think, stronger and better for it. Well, here. This young lady came to see me today. Her name is Vinnie Ream. Oh, yes. I think I read an article about her in the Smithsonian Magazine. She did a bust uh, on you or something. She did indeed, and I'm enormously proud of it. You see, sir, she's only 24 years old. And seven years ago, she discovered quite by accident that she had a considerable talent as a sculptress. How great a talent you may find out when I tell you that when a national competition was held to find an artist to make a statue of Lincoln after his assassination to be put in our nation's capitol building. She was selected over all the artists who competed. That is a picture of her statue, sir. Oh, yes. I knew the man. It is him to the life. No, sir, but talented as she is, 
and gifted as she is, and prominent as she has become in a world in which men predominate, it would never occur to her to think of herself as anything less than a woman, and more than that, a lady. Nor would she permit any man to treat her as anything less. Ah, but I have wandered from the question. of You were asking if the right were relevant in your world. Do employers look after the interests of the working men and women along with their own? Well, it is better than it used to be, but, but it could be better. Do all men practice honesty and integrity in all things? Do men in top positions of power refuse to lie, even though it be to their advantage? Do men no longer rejoice when people who stand high in the regard of the world fall into shame and disregard? Does every man understand that if he has not fallen, it is only because he has not been adequately tempted? Or do you still have all of that in your world? Oh, yes, we have all of that. Yeah. But perhaps most important, is religious fanaticism and intolerance gone from your world? Are men willing to let other men follow the dictates of their own hearts and consciences and find God in their own way? I'm afraid we have fallen far, far behind in that. We call them terrorists, and all over the world they are willing to kill because they hate those who do not see things the same as they do. Well then, sir, you can answer your own question for yourself. Is a fraternity that teaches men to live by the highest ethics and standards of morality, which teaches them that women are their equal in all things, which insists that no man has a right to feel superior to any other, but must be compassionately concerned for all in society, no matter how poor or how low in status they may be, a fraternity which above all teaches that each man has a right to absolute independence of thought in all things, intellectual and political and religious. Well, is there a need for such a fraternity in your world? Yes, oh yes. I read something you wrote about just yesterday. God commands us to love one another to love our neighbors as ourselves. God commands us to love one another, to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we dispute and wrangle and hate and slay because we cannot be of one opinion as to whether this doctrine or that is truth or heresy, drenching the earth with the blood of brother killed by brother for opinion's sake, depopulating realms, making the entire earth a charnel house, reeking with human blood and gore. Hatred has seeped into all of her veins and polluted them. As the earth rolls round the sun, she is an object of horror to her sisters in the universe. Oh, sir, the very flames which are symbols of light and truth and love, the flames which lift us from savagery and bring us hope, flare from books burned by despots, or men and women, martyred in the fires of the Inquisition. Or from the fire from exploding fuel tanks from airplanes. Your, your pardon, sir? No, oh, nothing. You mentioned that fire was a symbol of light and truth and love. And that's something else I wanted to ask you. Why do you teach everything using symbols and allegories? Why don't you just tell us what you want us to know? It seems like it would be much more efficient that way. Perhaps. This is a book on geometry and trigonometry. 
When I was 19 years old, I taught school in Massachusetts. Now, would my students have learned geometry and trigonometry if I had simply given them the book and told them to study it? Well, I don't know. I suppose they could. Well, they certainly could have learned the theory that way. And I taught them the theory that way. That is knowledge. But then I took them outside and I said, you see this tree? If I were to cut it down, and if it fall toward the school building, is it tall enough to damage it? I gave them other problems to solve as well. They had to worry them and worry them and think about them and apply the theory that they had learned in class. But when they did, they discovered that they had information they could use in solving problems in the real world. Then they not only had knowledge, they had understanding. You, you see, brother, the teachings of the, of the Scottish writer are intended to be more than just theory and speculation. They're intended to be completely practical. They are ways of living a good and happy and productive life in which we're not only happy ourselves, we're able to make others happy. We teach them by these symbols because that is the best way. Only when you dig out the meanings of something, as you would dig out gold from the earth, is it truly yours. It's just like my students solving the problems in trigonometry. I guess I'm just not used to thinking about symbols. Oh? Uh, may I see your hand, sir? <laughs> what is that, may I ask? Well, it's a wedding ring. Ah. Uh, do you wear it so that you will always have some gold with you in case you need to purchase food or shelter? No, it's a part of the wedding ceremony. Weren't you married? Sir, my wife Mary Ann Hamilton Pike and I had 11 children. I was very married indeed. So, uh, you wear the ring because it has meaning to you. What does it mean? Well, I, it means love and caring and staying together no matter what happens. That a promise has no end, just like the ring. Now, so you do think about symbols? <laughs> Apparently. Of course you do. Ah, but you were not born knowing those meanings. You had to learn them. And the more you have thought about them and, and considered them, the richer they have become. The same thing is true with the symbols of the right, sir. So that is why the Scottish rite teaches with symbols. It is the richest and indeed the most efficient way that we can give you the information which you can with work turn into understanding. Will you explain some of those symbols to me? I will be happy to give you my thinking on them, sir, and you're perfectly welcome to use that in your own thinking, but remember, each person must ultimately interpret the symbols for himself. Well, the uh, double-headed eagle is <laughs> perhaps the most commonly used symbol of the Scottish Rite. What does it really mean? Well, sir, one of its meanings is that each man must establish an empire over himself. But perhaps its most common meaning is that of equilibrium. Equilibrium? Balance, the reconciliation of two opposing conflicts or forces. You might think of this as representing the past and the future. Or the spiritual nature of man and his physical nature. Or the duties we owe to others, the duties we owe to ourselves, the needs of society, the needs of the individual. This idea of harmony or balance uh, is one of the great secrets of the universe. And virtually every philosophy and every religion man has known has dealt with it. Well, uh, by a hand, sir. That, that is the goddess Mart. The Egyptians used her to symbolize not only harmony and balance, but the rightness of things, 
the way things need to be for the universe to work. You'll find the same symbolism, incidentally, in Jachin and Boaz, or in the Three Lesser Lights, where the worshipful master represents the balance between the other two. Mm -hmm. Ah, or there, sir, that is the Greek goddess Themis, the, uh, the, the Romans called her Justiniana. You'll find her today outside many court buildings. That scale of balance she, she holds is, is the same symbol, the symbol of equilibrium. In the civil courts, equilibrium is maintained by balancing conflicting claims and desires. And uh, it is the task of the courts to restore that balance. Ah, this, sir, uh, is one of my most prized possessions. Until just a few years ago, when the rheumatism made it impossible, I used to spend at least one month every summer in Indian territory, uh, camping and hunting with the tribes. This is a peace pipe. The bowl is stone and represents Mother Earth. The stem with the feathers and the colored streamers represents Father Sky. The smoke is a prayer of thanksgiving to both. But the peace pipe as an object of sacredness gains its full potential only when the, the stem and the bowl are joined, a symbol to the tribes and to me of the sacred nature of the earth and that the harmony and balance between the two must never be disturbed. Then one of the things which the double-headed eagle symbolizes is that all things in my life are supposed to be in balance, that I have both a spiritual and a physical nature. Yes, sir, it means that. And it means much more, for it also represents the balance between divine mercy and divine justice, as well as the balance by which God maintains the forces of the universe. Well, if all of those symbols represent two opposites or forces combining to make a single thing, does the triangle represent three forces combining to make the same thing? Yes, you could think of it that way. Or you might also think of it as, as three aspects or elements of one thing. The triangle is an ancient symbol of the deity, sir. I probably because so many of his attributes seem to come in groups of threes. It is said that the creation of the universe required the intellect or will to create, the power to create, and the interaction between the will and the power, or that God's primary attributes are spoken of as wisdom, strength, and harmony, or beauty which is why those form the elements of the Lodge. And the right triangle is said to symbolize the complete man who is composed of body, mind, and spirit. Uh, whereas the, uh, the equilateral triangle represents the perfect man, that is to say, the man in whom body, mind, and spirit are in perfect equilibrium. Now, if that is true, what do you suppose is the meaning of two interlaced equilateral triangles, such as form the Magen David or the Seal of Solomon? Well, you said that the meaning of the equilateral triangle was the perfect man with mind, body, and spirit, and God with the three elements of his nature. So, Maybe it could represent man's reaching up toward God and God reaching down toward man? Hmm. Now, does that seem true to you? Is that useful in your thinking? Well, yes, it is. Well then, sir, whatever that symbol may mean to anyone else, or whatever further meaning it may come to have for you as you think about it, it will always have that meaning for you. I can see how this can get to be fun. Well, sir, it's not intended to be painful. <laughs> <laughs> is this what I think it is? It is a clay lamp, sir, from the time of the Roman Empire. 
One filled it with olive oil and then put a wick in the smaller opening. This is the kind of lamp which we use as a symbol of education. Many colleges and high school use it as their seal or emblem. But that's something else I'd like to ask you about. Masonry uses light all the time as a symbol. What does it really mean? Well, what examples can you remember offhand? Well, we talk about the search for light. In the Blue Lodge, there are the three greater lights, the three lesser lights, and in the Scottish Rite, the number and colors of the candles change with the degrees. There's the candelabrum in the temple. Now, there's many examples. Now, that is very true, sir. Now, let us think about light itself. Of what could it serve as a symbol? Well, obviously, light can be a symbol of God. All of the old painters showed him surrounded by light. Yes. That burst of light is called a glory. What else? Well, they showed sacred objects with that same light, too. So I suppose light could also represent sacredness. So light can be a symbol of God or of sacredness. Pray continue. Well, the stars represent points of light. So in a way, light could symbolize the universe, I suppose. Indeed. When it's dark, you can see where you're going and avoid getting hurt if you have a flashlight. Uh, a flashlight? No, uh, I'm sorry, a lamp. Mm -hmm. So light could be a, a symbol of safety and security. Mm -hmm. As well as being the opposite of darkness. Uh, and then plants have to have light to grow, so I suppose that light could also be a symbol of growth. I've already said that they appear on school books and diplomas and things like that, so it's obvious that, that light is a symbol of knowledge. Is there some way you can group all of these ideas around some central theme or thought? Well, I'll try. The search for light is the search for the knowledge of God and the sacred in life. And that search involves my preparation and discovery within myself of my real spiritual nature and my relationship to God. It also involves being guided by that light so I avoid injury. And it involves growing. Excellent, sir. Especially for one who is... Uh not used to thinking in symbols. <laughs> I see what you mean by symbols. But I wonder, is it the symbols which make everything so secret? And why is everything so secret anyway? That is an interesting question, sir. I, I suppose they may have contributed to it, although the real purpose of the symbols is to conceal things from ourselves, not from the world at large. I think it more likely, though, that the, uh, the secrecy is a phenomenon of our time. Well, my time, I should say. The, your question makes it appear that it is different in yours. Secret societies are enormously popular right now, sir. There are many hundreds. Almost everybody belongs to two or three. It gives them something to do in the evenings. Each has its own purpose. There, there are societies whose purpose is to practice fancy marching. I know one whose purpose is to practice singing and others uh, who have no purpose except the convivial one of sharing feast and drink together. As it happened, a couple of days ago, a story appeared in the newspapers about the secret societies in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, the copy is in the, uh, in the drawer of the desk, sir, if you would have the kindness to find that. And to read it, please. My uh, eyes cannot handle newsprint in this light. Yes, there are a number of them listed. 
Freemasonry, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry, the Odd Fellows, the Knights of Pythias, the Knights of Columbus, the Improved Order of Red Men, the Supreme Tribe of Ben Hur, the York Rite of Freemasonry, the Knights of the Golden Circle, the Sons of Temperance, the Sons of Honor, the Independent Order of Good Templars, the Prudent Patricians of Pompeii, <laughs> The prudent patricians of Pompeii must be kidding. And that's only about a third of the list. It will be obvious to you that an organization which is truly secret would hardly publish its, its time of meeting and place to the public gaze. But Masons wear pins and rings to identify ourselves. Our buildings have signs. Why, uh, even the ritual has been largely in print for 150 years. The curious may purchase a copy at their booksellers. But some people in my time wonder why, if we're not secretive, if we're not up to some wrongdoing, that we don't just open up our meetings to anyone. Because they have not earned the privilege of being present. Or, or do people in your time think they have a right to know everyone's private business just because they are curious. <laughs> Some do. <laughs> no, sir, no, no, no. When I opened that door to you this evening, I knew much about you, although I had never met you. That ring with the square and compasses told me much. Membership in masonry, sir, is not a right to be exercised. It is a privilege to be earned. Well, yes. Ah, you have earned my respect by what you have done. You have earned the right to come to me and bring any problem that you wish in confidence, knowing it will not be repeated, because you have promised to do the same thing. You have earned my trust and confidence, because I know you have promised never to cheat or wrong or defraud a brother. <laughs> but, sir, the world at large hath not made those promises, taken those obligations, passed those examinations. Although the lodge stands willing to welcome them if they wish to proceed to do so. I told you I'd been an active Scottish Rite Mason for a while, and I, in fact, I've tried to be active in several branches of the fraternity. But in my world, we don't like to think that there's anything special about anyone or that one person is better than another. Is it really so special being a Mason? Sir, if your world truly sees no difference between a George Washington and a Benedict Arnold or a man who devotes his life to the poor who is the friend and protector of those who have no other friend and protector, and the man who lines his own pockets with gold, no matter whom he may harm or impoverish. Uh, well, then I weep for what my world is to become in your future. All men may be created equal, and all men are and should be equal in the eyes of the law that they are by no means equal in how they develop, what they choose to become. To be so, to be accepted as a member of the Scottish Rite, <laughs> the greatest honor of my life, oh, to think of being one brotherhood with such men as George Washington or Benjamin Franklin or, or Moliere or, or, or Mozart. Oh, John Marshall, Sam Houston. <laughs> Sir, we are in a company of great, great men. The firmament of our earth is illuminated by such stars as these. They glitter and glitter there. They and so many, many more giving light to all the men and women of the earth. And they shine there because they, like you and I, have promised to lead lives of compassion, 
and honor and integrity. To be considered worthy a belonging of belonging in such a company of men, <laughs> that is a very high honor indeed. It is, Grand Commander, and it is the nature of the world that such men are attacked by those who do not appreciate their character. I know you had critics in your own lifetime, and there are still those who write things attacking you. Do you mind if I ask you about some of them? Uh, you may ask me, sir, any question which one gentleman may ask of another. Well, it is said that you hate Roman Catholics. Is that true? I do not hate any man because of his religion, nor do I hate any religion. I do hate what some people have done in the name of religion. You may know that in 1884, just a few years ago, Pope Leo XIII came out with a papal encyclical entitled Humanum Genus. In it he attacked the fraternity. He accused us of believing in democracy, whereas all men knew that democratically elected leaders were illegitimate. He accused us of believing in public education, whereas all men knew that only priests and nuns were entitled to teach the young. It went on and on like that. Well, I wrote a response, and there has been a certain coolness sense over the years, which I regret, but no, sir, I do not hate Catholics. I, I could not be a good mason with hatred in my heart. Are there any religions with which masonry would not be compatible? No, masonry is not a religion. Masonry does not tell men what path they should follow to salvation. We say of God that he is a good and loving father and cares for us, but we say very little more than that about him. No, sir, you see, masonry is concerned with this life. Masonry tells men how to live good and successful lives, which also benefit other people. But in this world, we are perfectly prepared to let religion take care of the next. But there are, sir, some attitudes held by some people who think they are religious, which are entirely incompatible with Freemasonry. Intolerance, bigotry, this attitude of saying, I know what is true, and if you disagree with me, you are a sinner and a devil, and I have the right to hurt you. That attitude is incompatible with Freemasonry, as it is incompatible with humanity itself. Unlike in music, sir, there are some dissonances which cannot be resolved. Grand Commander, I've seen parlor organs like that in museums. I've often wondered what it would be like to play one and what they sounded like. Well, then pray, sir, satisfy your curiosity. <laughs> Pardon me, sir. I cannot understand how someone who believes in humanity as strongly as you obviously do would also be a believer in slavery. What, sir? Well, I remember the lyrics you wrote for Dixie were more popular during the war than the lyrics we use in our time. Are you suggesting that I was a supporter of slavery? You were a general in the Civil War for the Confederacy. You were a justice of the Supreme Court for the Confederacy? Has it come to that? You said more than a hundred years had passed. Do, do people in your time believe that the great issues of the Civil War were merely a question that the, the North wanted to free the slaves and the South wanted to preserve slavery? Well, yes, but... No. 
I knew of no one who was a supporter of slavery, who thought it was a good thing, although undoubtedly there were such people. But how do you end slavery? Decree in a single day that the slaves are free? Oh, but then where do they sleep that night? What do they eat the next day? No. I believed that the only way to end slavery was to make it economically unnecessary, even economically a burden, not the way the North had done it. There were slaves in the North too although they did not so call them. Women and children who worked in their manufactories at so low a wage that they actually starved to death while working. But I argued to increase shipping and manufacturing in the South, to broaden our economic base. And in 1856, when the Southern Convention introduced a resolution to resume the slave trade, I took the floor and spoke against it. And I ended that speech by saying that I looked forward to a day when all men would be free. For that speech, sir, I was booed off the floor of the Convention. My character assassinated, and I was threatened with physical abuse. No, sir. I was no lover of slavery, but to me and to many others, that was never the question or the issue of the war. The issue was whether the state governments or the federal government was to have the most power. And I, along with many others, believed that the state governments could do a better job of protecting the rights and the welfare of their citizens. I'm sorry I gave offense. I didn't mean to. Uh, no, sir. It is mine to apologize. I am sorry. Some old wounds run deep. But if you would know what I truly thought on the matter, consider the words of the 33rd degree. You have heard them in their entirety. Surely, one day, the whole world will become God's holy temple, the habitation of truth and brotherhood, with all men living as the children of a common father should, in obedience to his eternal laws of equity and charity. When all over the world truth shall have taken the place of error, toleration of fanaticism, love of hatred, and brotherhood of enmity, then will the work of Scottish Freemasonry be completed, the Holy Land reconquered, and the Holy House of the Temple rebuilt. That is my hope, sir, and my vision, and my most profound prayer. So mote it be. But tell me, how did you end up in the South? You were born in Boston. Well, the answer is simple, sir. I got lost in a fog. And it, it's true, I assure you. It was on that trip back from Taos I was telling you about. It was a disaster economically. And a couple of my friends and I, we were all in our early 20s, decided we would leave the company and go to South America because we had heard... Yeah, we had heard that a man could make his fortune there. Well, it rained heavily for a solid week. And the clouds were so thick, the fog so heavy, we never could see the sun to get our bearings. And when the sun finally did break free, 
we found we'd been going in the wrong direction. We were about to cross the river into the Arkansas Territory. <laughs> I, I, crossed, I crossed that river with four cents in my pocket. But it was in Arkansas that I first became a newspaper editor and that I first read for the law. Judge Lacey there examined me and gave me my license to practice law. He, he said, well, it's not like a license to practice medicine. You can't kill anybody. <laughs> the next week, he assigned me to defend a man charged with murder. I lost the case and the man was hanged. Only man I ever defended for murder who was hanged. Probably the only one who shouldn't have been. And, of course, it was Judge Lacey who introduced me to my beautiful wife, Mary. All in all, sir, the best thing that ever happened to me was getting lost in that fog. You mentioned your wife. My wife questions why I ought to join an organization that doesn't have women as members. In my time, many organizations are for both. As in mine, sir. But men need time with men. As women need to spend time in the company of women. And men and women need to spend time in the company of both. I wrote a ritual for a, a body of the fraternity for both men and women. Although, uh, yeah, very little ever came of it. Well, just one more question. Please, it's late and I know you must be tired, but I really want to try to pull all this together uh, to know. What does it really mean to be a good Mason? Ah. Well, as I recall, sir, when you arrived, you had a copy of Morals and Dogma with you. Uh, bring it to me, please. I will mark a passage for you. The good mason does the good thing which comes in his way, and because it comes in his way, from a love of duty, he is true to his mind, his conscience, heart, and soul, and feels small temptation to do to others what he would not wish to receive from them. You see their masonry in their work and in their play. It appears in all the forms of their activity individual, domestic, social, ecclesiastical, or political. The true Mason has more goodness than the channels of his daily life will hold. It runs over the banks to water and to feed a thousand thirsty plants. Not only willing, he has a salient longing to do good to spread his truth, his justice, his generosity, his masonry over all the world. His daily life is a profession of his masonry, published in perpetual goodwill to men. Not more naturally does the beaver build or the mockingbird sing his own wild gushing melody then the true Mason lives this beautiful outward life. The Mason does not sigh and weep and make grimaces. He lives right on. If his life is as whose is not, marked with errors and with sins, he plows over the barren spot with his remorse, sows with new seed, and the old desert blossoms like a rose. He is not confined to set forms of thought or action or of feeling. He accepts what his mind regards as true, what his conscience decides is right, what his heart deems generous and noble, and all else he puts far from him. His masonry is his freedom before God, not his bondage unto men.